Hello everyone, this is Miss Peachy from your WCA Biology B class and we are doing our Unit 3 Lesson 5 10% Rule lesson today. Our keywords are biomass, invasive species, photosynthesis, primary consumer, producer, secondary consumer, tertiary or third consumers, and trophic level. So you'll notice that all of the terms should be familiar with the exception of one new one this lesson, and that is invasive species, which you may have heard of before, but we will elaborate and go through what invasive species are and some examples of them today. So ladies and gentlemen, I feel vindicated here. So in my last lesson, I pointed out that I believe this graphic to be incorrect. I am hoping that as you go through your lesson, this has been fixed at this time. At the time of the recording, it is still wrong, but I have put in an order to get it fixed. And the reason why I feel vindicated is because when we scroll down and look at the text here, it says the pyramid shows producers with 5,000 units of energy. Our pyramid shows producers with 2,500 units of energy. So there's a little bit of a, of a mistake here in this. So we're just gonna cross that out and put a 500 thousand here okay and I said that before but now I know that they were wrong um, so the 10% rule we covered in the last lesson and this is showing that as you move up the trophic pyramid from producers up to first order consumers our secondary consumers our tertiary consumers and our quaternary consumers at every level we move upwards we are losing 90 percent of the energy and only 10 percent of that energy remains so if we have 5,000 joules of energy at the bottom we have 500 in the next level 50 for the herring here five for the mackerel and only 0.5 for our tuna so this is um, discussing how energy flows from bottom to top. Energy will always in an ecosystem flow in one direction. It will not flow backwards. It cannot be recycled. Unlike matter, whereas matter can be recycled. So if we have any one of these organisms die, they can be decomposed by decomposers and their matter can be recycled back to be used by producers again to make more producers, right? Energy does not do that. Energy is just transferred and it is lost. And we'll talk about how it's lost in this next picture. So since only 10% can be transferred to the next highest trophic level, what happens to the remaining 90%? The remaining 90% is used in processes for that organism. So these are some metabolic processes. You need energy to do um, anything in your body, right? So if you eat something, some of that energy is being used to do stuff. Um, that's wonderful. But the rest of it you don't use. You just lose that and that is lost as heat to the atmosphere. So much of the energy that has been stored in the food that you consume is just lost as heat. We are losing a lot as heat. Heat is given off even by exothermic organisms just because of metabolic processes. So the other thing it talks about is how when you look at biomass in an ecosystem, biomass isn't always going to be even from top to bottom. For example, in one ecosystem, maybe our producers are made up of a bunch of blades of grass, right? A whole field of grass. They don't weigh very much. There's not much biomass there, but there's a lot of the producers, right? There's a lot of blades of grass, excuse me. But in a different ecosystem, maybe the producers is a single oak tree, which is a much more massive thing than a bunch of grass. So we have to be kind of careful when we look at this because um, even though we depict these as perfectly even pyramid bars, sometimes the numbers of organisms and the mass we find at each trophic level is going to vary a little bit. 
So our next slide talks about how to do these energy transfer calculations. Although the 10% rule is widely accepted, it's always a good thing to look at individual circumstances and see how well that 10% rule is adhered to. If it's way off, if you're not transferring enough energy to the next trophic level, there might be something wrong in that ecosystem. So what you do is you take the energy level transferred to the next level, so the amount of energy we transfer from one level to the next, divided by the total energy input and multiplied by 100 to get the percent of energy that is transferred. So in the first example, they say, let's say our producer is grass and grass has 150,000 kilocalories of energy. The rabbits eat that much grass, but they are only able to use 16,500 kilocalories of energy. When I divide those two together and multiply by 100, we've come up with the efficiency of energy transfer from grass to rabbit is 11%. So in this ecosystem, slightly more than 10% is being transferred. Then we have our second example using the rabbit to the fox. And here we have a perfect 10%. So this is how we can calculate the actual transfer of energy versus that 10% rule, which is like the hypothetical transfer of energy. Then you're going to go ahead and look at a couple of examples, checking in to see that you guys can solve these problems. Oops, I don't need a pen here. And then finally, on slide number nine, it talks about a concept or a type of organism known as an invasive species. Invasive species are non-native species that cause harm to an ecosystem. Please keep in mind that not all non-native species are in fact invasive. In fact, the majority of non-native species are in fact not invasive. Only some of them become invasive, but we can never know for sure which ones are going to be invasive. Perhaps this new species to an ecosystem is very, very aggressive and can outcompete native species for resources, therefore causing harm to native species and wreaking havoc on the entire food web. Maybe they do not have predators or there are no diseases that keep their numbers in check. So they, their numbers explode and they, they require a lot of energy. Remember that according to our energy pyramid, there's only so much energy available from one trophic level to the next, only 10%. So as we get to the highest trophic levels, there is a very small amount of energy that's available to support those tertiary and quaternary consumers. Therefore, if we add an invasive species that is a quaternary or tertiary consumer, there might not be enough energy in the ecosystem to support both that new species and an existing species. So they can outcompete a native species and that can be a really big problem for that ecosystem. In the previous lesson, we talked about keystone species, a way in which invasive species can become super harmful as if they replace a keystone species or wipe out a keystone species in an ecosystem. An example of an invasive species is the zebra mussel. And this is actually a really relevant example to um, us here in Wisconsin. Zebra mussels are very, very problematic in the Great Lakes. And I believe they've even moved to some larger inland lakes as well in Wisconsin. Zebra mussels um, are non-native and they grow very, very well. They are filter feeders. So one of their issues is they clean the water and they make it really, really clear which you might think is a good thing, but it's really not because they're taking away a food source from some of our primary consumers. So they, they clear the water and some of our primary consumers, which are often are like zooplankton and small fish and stuff like that, they don't have a food source and that can really wreak havoc on fisheries in the Great Lakes. Another thing that they do is they actually cause a lot of structural damage. Um, they grow in like these big mats of zebra mussel shells and they can actually clog pipes. They talk in the lesson here about um, the nuclear power plant pipes, but they also can, can clog water intake pipes to water treatment plants. A lot of people who live on the Great Lakes get their water, their drinking water from the lake itself and pipes bring that water in and it's, it's processed and treated 
and then is distributed to people's you know houses and stuff and if zebra mussels clog those pipes then you're not getting an adequate supply of water you have to send people out to fix them to unclog them um, they can cause damage too by just by just damaging the pipes they have to be replaced they get corroded a lot easier and so um, they really do wreak havoc on both ecosystems and man-made stuff structures and stuff like that all right so just an example of what an invasive species is invasive species always have the effect of decreasing biodiversity in, a, in an ecosystem because of the fact that they are invasive um, they are out competing natives and generally decrease the diversity of native species so ultimately the whole diversity is going to decrease again remember not all non-natives are invasive so you can have a non-native species come into an ecosystem and it doesn't really do anything in that case diversity is a little bit more than it was previously but that's not a good idea because we just don't know what species will become invasive and which won't it's just it's like a russian roulette at that point you know it's um it's not worth the gamble because they could cause harm all right so that's the end of this lesson ladies and gents if you've got questions let me know otherwise i will see you in the next one